just um, just want you to know that we are t- today we are interrupting um, our series of church as a signpost for new creation. We're interrupting it um, because we're going to do things a little bit differently today. What I want to do today is I want to share some news with you, um, and then I'm going to just share very briefly from a scripture, and then we're going to take communion. Does that all sound alright? We're on board with that. We what are we doing? Great. I'm going to have to repeat myself. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. So, the news that I want to share with you today is that um, Michelle and myself are going to be taking a three month sabbatical. And we're going to aim to take it from the 2nd of December. Um, we've been in discussion with our eldership team since about July um, about this possibility, and they strongly encouraged us to consider taking a sabbatical. And the the trustees, as well as Chris Vinant and uh, the guys on the Genesis team, which is the uh, the, the team that Michelle and I are part of, which they're going to be around here in a a couple of weeks, um, they have also strongly suggested that we do this. And so Michelle and I have decided to take their advice. Now, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the idea of a sabbatical, it's something which is quite normal in certain business, certain uh, uh, careers, and certainly normal in the context of ministry. Um, it's, it's a wise thing to do, and it's a common thing to do for, for pastors and vicars and uh, the like to take three months out um, to recharge. Um, but there's two things that I particularly want to touch on uh, as I talk about this this morning. Um, Michelle and myself have been in ministry for over 22 years. And we've been leading King's Bay for over 12 years. And during that time, we've never taken any meaningful um, long leave. And this is a very unusual in the area of ministry. The Nigel and Alita who planted this church, they took three months long leave after nine years. Um, and the, the Chimers, who were part of our eldership team, and were part of our eldership team for a long time, they took a sabbatical, and the Harpers have taken a sabbatical. But Michelle and I have just kept on pushing it out. And in hindsight, uh, I think that was a mistake. Because um, the reality of it is that I'm weary. And we show now quite tired. You know, you think you can hide it at moments, but I have a feeling that you are too perceptive to be fooled by my attempts. And on top of everything else, I only recently realized actually that. Um, the, the last five years, how much the last five years have actually impacted me, uh, more than I thought. For, for many reasons, it's been incredibly disorientating being a church leader um, at this time. And quite simply, I wasn't prepared for it. I, I, did, I missed the course on leading through a pandemic. I regret that now, but I did it. <laughs> and so Michelle and I want to make sure that we can find some space to be rejuvenated, not only for our own souls, but that we can be a blessing to others and we can be a blessing to this church. Michelle and I just need to take some time to stop and to rest. Michelle's been reading a psalm, uh, Psalm 23, which you all know well. And um, she's been drawn to this verse which says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Particularly that sense of God makes you. And it feels, to be honest with you at the moment, that that's what God is doing. He is making us do this. And to ignore this, I think, would be disobedient, as well as being foolish. But there is a second aspect to this that I want to talk about. Rest is important because our bodies, our emotions, and our souls need it. But rest is also a vital demonstration and component of trust. We can see this in the example of the Sabbath, which was used by God gave to the nation of Israel. Um, every week they were to take a day and do nothing. Even when there was work to be done, even when there was uh, uh, harvesting that needed to take place, even though there were issues that needed to be dealt with, there was a discipline that they had to do. They had to stop, focus on God, and do nothing. Now there are a number of components as to why the Sabbath was there. I'm not going to go into the massive, a lot of theology around that. But a big reason for doing that was to demonstrate trust. It demonstrated that they trusted that God would supply their needs and look after them 
while they were in the vulnerable position of doing nothing. Rest was a declaration that they understood that ultimately God is the one in whom they were dependent. And that God was actually working for them. Rest equals trust. And this worked into the rhythms of Jewish life every week. It was part of their rhythm. It was part of who they are. And a weekly reminder of where their strength lay and where their trust lay. And so it should be for you and for me. Every day, every week, every year, we should find a way of stopping. Find a way of resting. Find a way of reflecting on the goodness of our God. And handing over to Him our worries and our cares. In Psalm 127, it says this, another well-known psalm, which I think pastors all over the world turn to regularly. Unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, and God and, and, and the guards stand watching vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Now, if you go to your Bibles, you'll find that there's a little um, note. Because another way of, of uh, translating that last line is, He provides food while you sleep. Isn't that a beautiful picture? We can rush around, but He's the one who actually provides while you're doing nothing. It almost feels guilty thinking about that. Rest equals trusting God to work for us. And over the last two months, about the last two months, um, we've seen a number of prophetic words coming through um, the life of the church around this idea of um, trusting God and not relying on your own strength. Um, and, and quite surprisingly, from even though uh, uh, in our leaders' time, one of the images and the themes we were looking at was sailing and and uh, that was an image we were using for what we thought God was saying. And then a whole lot of people started sharing stuff about yachts. We didn't even know anything about it, including my mate Malachi. And we were sitting in a, in a prayer meeting on the, um, on the one of the Thursdays, and, uh, and Mal brought a prophetic word. He said, I feel like what's this word about this, this, this boat? And it's, a, it's in, the, in the sea, and there's a, there's a lot of waves and things pushing around. And, and I feel God is saying, stop working in your own strength. And to lift up your sail, lift up the mast, and let the, 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 the God guide you, lead you. Michelle comes up to me. She said, Did you hear that word? <laughs> Did you hear that word? I think. I heard that word. And although I think an element of that word is certainly part of a broad theme that God is speaking to us as a church, what does it look like for us to rest? And to trust him, I could say to myself, that word was for me. I know that this prophetic thread has applications for me personally. And I'm seeing that actually taking a sabbatical is more than just the rest that we shut up our need, but it's a declaration that I trust God with this church, and not my own strength, not my own gifting, and not my own ability. Because it is Jesus who builds and sustains the church, and not me. And I think every pastor, this is going to maybe burst your bubble, but I think every pastor flirts with a messianic complex and believes that the church can't cope with us. This is particularly the case if you've been a pastor for a long time. You know how everything works. You know where everything is. You know what you just know, and you've been there before. And I also was reflecting on this, and I think that over COVID, we got into a mode, or I got into a mode, where we were trying to make a plan to keep our heads above the water. Let's do this, and we've got to fix this, and let's get this going. So another six months, we can make this work, and we can do this. And it was kind of like a continuous process of trying to make things happen, trying to make things work, trying to make it keep going. And eventually it becomes a habit, and you stop relying on God's strength, and rather trust your own. But our own strength is finite. And there's a passage in Isaiah 40, which has become something which is important to me. It says, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Even the strongest 
eventually run out of their own strength. Even the most able run out of their own abilities. But you know, sometimes when God is working with leaders, like I think he's working with Michelle and myself at the moment, he's also working, there's the opportunity that he's actually speaking and working with the church. Broadly. It's almost like he can work with us as a sign of what he's doing broadly with the church. Consequently, I don't only think that this will be a significant time for Michelle and myself, but I also think it's going to be a significant time for the church. I was talking to someone this week, and they said to me they believe that this is going to be significant in creating a shift spiritually in the church. Yes, Lord, let it be. So, at the time, I'd love you to pray for the shadow and myself as we take this time out. But also, please pray for the church. You know, one of the things that, as well as these prophetic words coming through, is that don't trust in yourself, but rely on my strength. There is also a, a real sense that God is doing something fresh and beautiful in this church. I felt like in, in, in the end of August, the beginning of September, something shifted. And then we, you know, we, so give you an example, we've got prophetic words in the beginning of the year which were all associated with like trees that couldn't bear fruit, or fruit that couldn't burst, or fruit that was just being restricted. And then since the end of August, beginning of September, we've just been getting prophetic words about the trees are full, new fruits are coming, pomegranates. And then Eleanor comes into our office on Friday and she brings me, I've got this painting for you that we, I did it in 2018, and I really feel this for the church, and she opens, and it's a massive tree with laden with fruit. There's a sense of God doing something with us. Are you coming out of the cloud of COVID? Are you coming out of the, the heaviness? Are you coming out from under a rock? And I'm hugely excited about this. And part of this journey is Michelle and myself taking some rest. Please. Pray for us, but let's pray and expect to see about what God is doing. Just a few little um, details before I turn to the text. I do want to emphasize that we have a capable and experienced eldership here in Kingsgate. We've got the Calders, we've got the Harpers, and there is uh, Sean, another duty, you need Kingsgate Carbon. They've been around. The more experienced I am as you, and they are in our team. So we've got capable people. I wouldn't go on sabbatical if I didn't feel we had an eldership team who could help be here with the church and the church and take the church on while we were away. Also, just to say that Chris Leonard, who has, as I say again, he's an apostolic voice to us in this church. He has been with this church since it was decided to plant this church. Um, and he needs the Genesis Collective team, which is a collaboration of churches working to plant churches around the world. They are going to be with us at the end of October. And um, one of their desires is to support Kingsgate while I'm away. And to help with any gaps that may result from Michelle and myself being away. We as a support for the elders, etc., etc. So not only have we got a great eldership team, but we've got the support of a, of a lot of people who love us. But the third thing I just wanted to mention is that I'm conscious that Michelle and I are involved in a lot of spaces. On a Sunday alone, preaching, hosting meetings, worship, setting up communion, kids ministry, etc., etc. And also, if you've noticed, that Michelle has become the new social media guru. If you don't, you should do. We're getting reels everywhere now, and uh, she's taken that uh, quite a self to do. But I am conscious that as a result of that, there are a few gaps that could be there while we're away. Can I ask two things of you? Can you, if you see a gap, step into it. Just step into it so that we can navigate this time. The second thing is, if there is a gap one Sunday, let me give you an example. We've had, we really do need to pray over our worship leaders. We've had um, one of our worship leaders, David Scudino, he's at Rubilo Cape up to Newcastle. Um, Ruben's not been able to lead worship, Sarah's not been well. And so after having five worship leaders, it's now myself and Henny and Joseph. And uh, so that was a lot of pressure. So if it comes to it, now we don't have a worship leader on a Sunday. So what are we going to do? What do you need? If we don't have a worship leader, 
and we have to sing a cappella. Then we just put and sing a cappella as loud as we can. We stand in that gap. We say, you know, we're not gonna, uh, 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 we're not gonna see what we don't have. We're gonna see what we do have. We're gonna embrace the different, the, the different side, and we're gonna make this work. That's what I ask you. We stand in the gap, and secondly, we just rejoice when there is a gap. Are we happy to do that? Thank you. Can you turn with me to one Chronicles? One Chronicles, verse seventeen. Sorry, one, one Chronicles chapter seventeen, verse one to sixteen. I love this particular passage. It speaks to me regularly. I'm going to read it, and I'm just going to make a few points, and then you're going to take me. Now, when David lived in his house, David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold. I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell thy servant David, Thus says the Lord, It is not you who will build me a house to dwell in, for I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up Israel to this day. But I have gone from tent to tent, from dwelling to dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to share in my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture. From the following of sheep, from following the sheep, to be a prince over my people, Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a name like the name of the great ones of Edo. And I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall waste them no more, as formerly from the time that I appoint the judges over my people of Israel. And I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up for your offspring after you, one of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be a him to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from him who was before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I? O Lord God, what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And it goes into this beautiful prayer of David's. And in this te text, King David has these noble and wonderful ideas about the good things he is going to do for God. Noble, good. So noble and wonderful and righteous that the prophet Nathan agrees. I actually love this passage for any prophetic workshop. Nathan thought he had it right in God, so Nathan's coming, you ain't got it right, you're wrong. Don't say that. And God corrects David and reminds him about a fundamental truth that forms the backbone of the entire Bible. It is not firstly about what we do for God, but far more importantly, about what He has done, is doing, and will do for us. And in this rebuke of source, God uses that word I 14 times to drive home that point. And I love that particular verse that I was reflecting on this morning. You want to build me a house, David, I'm going to build your house. That's the way it works. And the result of this beautiful prayer of David is a grateful prayer of someone who knows that at the end of the day, they are not an achiever, they are not a doer, but an unworthy recipient of God's amazing grace. That they are ultimately a receiver. And that's why in some way, David's prayer can and should be all of our prayers. 
all of us in some way should be able to say, God, who am I that you have blessed me so? Who am I in my household that you have carried me so? Who am I that you have revealed yourself to me and opened my heart that I might worship you? Who am I that you have? By far and away, the main emphasis of the Bible is what God has done, is doing, and will do for us, and not what we do for Him. And although we can think of the Bible as detailing stories of a whole lot of great heroes of the faith, it is really the story of a great God who is redeeming His creation and reconciling His world back to Himself. This Bible is first and foremost God's story. And I heard someone say the other day, I loved it, there is only one hero in this Bible, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is one hero, it's Jesus. By far and away, the Bible emphasizes God's faithfulness and his love towards us, and not primarily our love and faithfulness towards him, because we are fickle, we change, but he is not like us, that he changes his mind, that he changes his faithfulness. Thank the Lord that you not rely on our own faithfulness and our own love. And our covenant-keeping God is not like the shifting sands. And the main emphasis of the Bible is that God works for us and not that we work for Him. The last, the, the, that said, last statement might shock you, as it shocked me when I first heard it. I was heard John Piper preaching, and he said this word, these words, that God works for us. But those words, what those words express is not that God is our servant and our lackey, who he gets for whatever he wants, he does for us, but rather that we are totally dependent on him for everything. For even the breath that we breathe. We cannot breathe. I love that song, I breathe the breath that he gave me to breathe to worship you. I love that song. I love it. It's one of my favorite worship songs. So I said, I can't even worship you, God, but you've given me breath. I can't even worship you, but you've given me motive, and you awaken my heart. I, I cannot exist without you. And in that beautiful passage in Acts chapter 17, when Paul is speaking to Ephesians, he says, God doesn't need anything from us. But like we can give him something that he's lacking. And wisdom comes from understanding our weakness without him. Wisdom comes from understanding our weakness without Him and our total dependence on Him. Knowing that we only work and keep going because He is continuously and actively working on our behalf and for us. It is a total affront to our pride. We want to be in control. We're not in control. We like to think so, but we're not. And actually, one of, if not the greatest way in which we worship the greatest way in which we worship God is by resting and trusting in His faithful and loving commitment to work for us. The greatest way that we worship God is by resting and trusting in His loving commitment and faithfulness to work for us, for our good and His glory. God delights when you rest and trust in His work for you. This is most profoundly demonstrated in our salvation, where we are not saved by our merits. We are not saved by our good works. We are not sustained by our merits. We are not sustained by our good works. We do not get to heaven and reign with Him in the new heaven and the new earth. We do not do that by our merits and our good works. It's Jesus, 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 Jesus the whole way. And when some, I remember back when Michael Eaton saying something along the lines of, when you hear somebody speaking about their salvation and they say, how did you get saved? Well, I was a really bad person, and then one day I was sort of, and I saw the light, and I decided I needed to follow Jesus. No! Where's Jesus in that? It's Jesus, 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 beginning to end. So there's this beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We can't boast, but in Jesus Christ. Whatever happens in the life of this church will never be because of some brilliance on our behalf, but it's because of what God has done. So that only God can boast about what He has done. 
The wisdom we have is to rely on Him, praise Him, listen to Him, be led by Him. John Piper says, what a truth, what a reality. God is up all night and day to work for those who wait for Him. Isaiah says it like this in Isaiah 64 verse 4. For since the world began, no ear has heard, and no eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for you. I need to hear this. I need to grasp this afresh in my heart. And I don't think I'm the only one. I'm the only one.